So, I've been talking about writing and planning your sequences. And this is what is going to solve the issue of timing, which perhaps you encountered, and I suspect you probably did, um, last week when you had to teach the 30-minute um, practice. Um, one of the things which, uh, one of the challenges that we come up against very early on is how do I time a practice so that it ends on time, so that it doesn't end up being too short or being too long? Well, the answer is you write and plan your practice, you write it down, and you use a, a technique called time stamps. You create time stamps so that, um, so that your classes are on time. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that now, and this is brilliant stuff, and this will take away any sort of fear. Um, if you follow this, it'll take away any fear you might have of, of ending uh, too early or too late. So, um, I've just drawn a line down the middle of the board so we can imagine this is maybe like two, two pieces of paper, and this is where you're going to write down your sequence. And um, what I'll do is I'll create a bit of a sequence for the 30-minute practice that you were doing last week, and then you can adapt this for the 45-minute practice, which you will be doing for your next practicum. Um, so, um, start off by writing some things that I know for sure. Um, so, and I'm going to do at zero minutes, so the beginning of the class, this is when I'm going to do introduction. So I'm going to introduce myself and introduce the theme of the class. So at zero minutes, introduction, and that's going to be very quick, I'm going to take me less than uh, less than a minute. So on minute one, I will be doing oming and uh, oming and you know uh, preparations. So yeah, it should be prepar. Let me let me write that the other way. Preparations and om. So let's say, uh, and by that I mean grounding and consecration and this kind of thing. Cool, so that's, oops, so that's one minute in. Um, and then that'll take me two minutes. So at minute three, I'm going to introduce Ujjayi breath. And at minute four, I'm gonna put everyone in child's pose. And then a minute five, we can do uh, pandiculation. And then that's gonna be my opening. Um, and now I'm just gonna go to the end of the practice because I know a few things about the end as well. So, I know that I'm going to end up by doing three ohms. So, on the on minute 30 is goodbye. So, um, let's say minute 29. Mm -hmm. It will be my arms. Now, what happens before the arms is I need to get from Shavasana to sitting upright. How long is that going to take me? Maybe Maybe let's say two minutes, I want to get a nice slow wake up from Shavasana. So at 27 minutes, wake up. And how long should Shavasana be? Well, it was a 30 minute class. Shavasana should be approximately 10% of the class. So three minute Shavasana. So 27 wake up, this means at 24 minutes, I go to Shavasana. Now this is important because you might think, oh, you know, it might be, most of us might think, only got a three minute Shavasana, great, I can go to Shavasana at 27 minutes in. But no, actually I need to, if I want to finish on time, I need to hit Shavasana at 24 minutes in. 
if I go to 20, if I started at 27 minutes in, then I'll just be waking everyone up at 30 and I'll be late and I'll be doing my goodbye uh, at 33 minutes past, you know, which might sound, well, it's only three minutes. M maybe, but what if you're working at certain studios in London where there is no overlap, there is no time between classes? So, and there are studios that do this, where one class finishes at 6 p.m. and the next class starts at 6 p.m. So there is no change over time between the classes. Most studios don't do that. Most studios will allow even 15 minutes is not very much, but they'll allow 15 minutes for there to be changeovers. But there are some studios that don't do any. There are some gyms that don't do any. So if you are um, going three minutes over, chances are what's gonna happen is the next teacher is just gonna come into your room, sorry, this is our room now, and walk right into your shavasana and say that, and they're right. It is their room. You should have finished by now. They're in the right. We, you know, we who are running long as yoga teachers uh, are not. Um, so we need to finish on time. Also, there's a ton of different reasons why you need to finish on time. It's, it's, um, it's just honesty. You, are, you do what you say you're going to do. That's integrity. Um, it's also a form of theft of run of going being late is a form of form of theft because you are stealing time from others you said you were going to finish at 6 p.m it's now five past six those five minutes were for that person may have been important to um, allocate to something else for example they might have to pick their kids up from school and now they're going to be late because you are late. Or maybe they knew the class was going to finish at 6 p.m. so they put enough money in the meter um, of the car outside to last till three minutes past six. But now because you've gone late, they're going to have a ticket. There are so many reasons why you need to finish on time. Um, and as an, as an employer, as someone who employs other yoga teachers, I can tell you that I don't keep people who can't stick to the timetable. Um, and, and, and many other employers will tell you the same. This is a, uh, an important thing, is to finish on time. So, doing this at the end shows you, ah, actually I need to go to Shavasana considerably earlier um, than, than just three minutes before the end of the class. Great, now that we've done that, so we've kind of got the warm up and we've got um, the end, we can see that we have 21 minutes of time to play with to fill the rest of our sequence. Great. So pandiculation, maybe do two minutes of that, around seven minutes, do ragdoll. And you don't have to do the time stamp for every single pose, right? So I could do ragdoll and then ulolas, and then I'm gonna do the path of yoga, sun salutation, um, and then I'm going to do warrior two. So maybe the next timestamp is here. You just say, okay, I wanna make sure that I'm in warrior two by the uh, 15 minute mark, right? And I'm not actually gonna timestamp those or you can, that's up to you. Personally, I just time, at this stage, I just timestamp everything. So it's okay, ragdoll, seven minutes. Uh, Lollas, we can get into that in nine minutes. Um, path of yoga, sun salutation can be 11 minutes. And there you go, it's all written out. Um, and then gonna do, uh, I'm gonna do warrior two. I'm going to do um, uh, rotated side angle or paravrita. I've misspelled it, but it's okay. Parsva Kanasana. So the I should be here, not there. Paravrita Parsva Kanasana, rotated side angle. Um, and I'm going to do, actually, I'm going to change that to 17 minutes. I'm going to do, at the 20 minute mark, I will do tree pose. At the 22 minute mark, I'm going to do uh, Paschimottanasana, seated forward fold. And at the 23 minute mark, I'm going to do uh, cobbler's pose. 
Now, um, well, let's look at it this way. You only needed to do one seated pose, right? In, that, in the sequence that we suggested for this week. So you've got through to Paschimottanasana and the 22 minute mark, that leaves a bit of a gap. And so this is where things get really clever. When you are creating your sequence, you should always have some extra poses in the sequence in case you find that you're going faster than expected. So you write some extra poses in, um, and you might do those in a certain color. So for example, here, I might write in this color with no, with no time stamp, but I write, might write Vadakanasana. And the reason why it's in a different color is because I'm probably not going to do this pose. But if I find that I'm getting uh, to my timestamps, uh, I'm too early in the sequence, then I might add um, Badakanasana. So if I find, let's say Paschimottanasana, yeah, that could work. You have a two minute Paschimottanasana and then Shavasana at 24. But let's say I get to Paschimottanasana and I'm only 20 minutes into my practice. That's okay, because I'm gonna add Badakanasana. I'm going to add that in. Um, and this one is also an extra pose, right? You only, the requirements were that you did just one standing pose. So um, I would probably write this one in blue as well. I'll just do an abbreviated version. Pav, pav. So these are two poses that I can, are optional. I can do them if I'm um, going too quickly. And I would also put a star next to anything that could be cut if I'm going too fast. So I might say, uh, sorry, if I'm going too slow. So for example, um, if it just, for whatever reason, let's say we got to warrior two and there were some real issues in that pose, people did not understand it, they'd never done it before, and you ended up taking six minutes teaching people to do warrior two, and you look at your watch and you're like, oh my god, it's 22 minutes in, um, okay, I'm just going to cut tree. So I put a little colored star next to poses that you can cut. This is what is going to save you in terms of timing, that when you create the sequence, you have two, thing, two additional things in your sequence. One is extra poses you can do if things are going too fast. Two is poses that you can cut if things are going too slow. So the idea of the timestamps is not that you stick to them religiously. Right? It's not that you're not looking at this and let's say your intro went long and now your intro is three minutes. That doesn't mean you get stressed. And go, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, my God, I've got too long. I've got to rush everything else. I've got to rush Ujjayi. I've got to rush child's pose. No, because you know that later on in the sequence, there are poses you can cut and that will bring you back to your time. Right? So um, the timestamps are there so that you, to give you an indication of if you are going fast or if you're going slow, and to give you an indication of how fast or how slow you're going, so that you can respond. So you go, ah, I'm five minutes slow right now. I know that at some point, I have to cut five minutes of content to get back and make sure I finish on time, to make sure that I get to this mark. This is the key mark, 24 minutes of asana, you need to hit that. So um, the timestamps are a guideline. When I taught you the chakra um, sequence, the three hour chakra sequence on this course, I, at a certain point, I was 18 minutes out from my sequence. It was 18 minutes um, out of sync with my timestamps. But it was okay because I was just like, okay, well, I know that there are um, certain things I plan to do that are, you know, it'd be nice to do them, but we ended up doing something else. We ended up spending more time in Muladhara Chakra than I had 
planned when I wrote it out. Um, but on the day, and I was teaching, and I was, I was actually, no, we need, this is, we need to get this. We need to get this in, into Muladhara. And it's okay, I'll remove one technique from Manipura, and I'll remove one technique from Vishuddha, and we'll be back on track. Um, so, yes, you have, uh, the timestamps are there to help you. And if you're using this timestamp uh, system, there's no reason for you to ever end up uh, stressed about timing, and there's no reason for you to ever end up long or short in your yoga class. You will always end up on time if you're using this system. There's one more thing that, um, one more tool in the toolbox that I want to add. Uh, just one second, my computer has shut down. Um, one more really useful tool, which is that I suggest that you create for yourself a closing sequence that you have available to you at any time. And this closing sequence is one that can change in length. So you can have a two minute version and you can have a 15 minute version and you can have everything in between. And this is super useful for if ever you finish your class way too quickly, let's say you had a two hour practice and you went through it and you finished it in an hour and 45, and you're like, oh God, there's 15 minutes of this class left. Well, you're gonna have a 15 minute end sequence that you can introduce. And I'm going to give you my uh, 15 minute closing sequence and you can adapt this um, in any way that you like. So, really simple. This is just three poses that you can do at the end of a class that are three really nice poses, and it can, actually, I'm gonna give you four. So, one um, nice pose that you could do should you ever finish too quickly and you need to lengthen the end of the class you can take pigeon pose or uh, 1990 which is the uh, most beginner the well the most gentle version of pigeon but i love it this one here where the um one shin is 90 degrees in front of you the other leg 90 degrees behind you and you just fold forwards over the front knee or if you want to go deeper over the front foot. I will do this with you in posture clinic for pigeon. But here you can stay two minutes or more. You could stay longer, but you can two minutes does not feel like a long time in this pose. It feels really nice just to chill out here. So at the end of a practice, you can do two minutes here. Come up very slowly. Maybe have a gentle awareness phase, that's another minute there. And then set up the other side. Two minutes this side. Come up slowly, take an awareness phase. Wow, that was just six minutes of content. content. Yeah? So if you finished your class really early, well, you could just do 90-90 pose for, it doesn't have to be two minutes, right? You could do it for 30 seconds on each side or a minute on each side or two minutes on each side. The point is, do you have to fill a gap at the end of your class? If you do, that is one pose um, that you can use. So um, that's just the first one. Second one, you can lie everyone down on the back and you can take eye of the needle, seven asana. So, holding either the back of the thigh or knee, and stay here. Again, you could do two minutes this side, and you could do two minutes this side. That's four minutes of content. At the end of this, release, grab a strap, and you can do leg and strap. Now you could do two minutes here, one minute here, come back up, do another minute here, 
and then do a minute in that direction. Now that was two, two, three, four, five on one leg. Come back up and do the other side. Again, two, three, four, and five on this leg. That's 10 minutes of content. You don't have to stay that long. You don't even have to do all of the variations of that, right? You could just do straight up. But this is all filling any gap that you might have at the end. Last one of these is a rec uh, reclining twist. So you often do this one with me. Pick up your hips, shift the hips over to the left, lift the knees, lower the knees to the right, reach the left arm out to the left. You can stay two minutes here before coming out and doing the second side. So with all of those poses, I mean, you've almost got 30 minutes of content there if you did all of them. And I don't suggest that you do all of them, but you can. But you have that in your back pocket now. So there, if you just take the time now to practice those poses, practice teaching those poses as an end sequence, as a closing sequence, you will never finish a class early ever in your entire teaching careers. Because anytime you look at your watch and you go, oh, there's 10 minutes left of this class, no problem. I'm gonna lie everyone down. I'm gonna do four minutes of um, leg and strap on each leg, which gives me eight minutes. Plus I'm gonna do one minute of um, reclining twist on each side, and that is 10 minutes. So you will always fill the gap. So there is no reason for your class ever to finish early um, again. And you know, stuff happens. It's happened to me before that I've taught um, in tri yoga and I, it's happened in, in both directions actually. Once that I taught um, a 75 minute class only to be told, as I told everyone to get down to Shavasana, one of the students went, James, this is a 90 minute class. Ah, damn, I've just finished. Okay, oh, okay, sorry, my mistake. Everyone grab your strap, leg and strap. Boom, let's do this, reclining twist. Great, it's a lovely end to a vinyasa practice is to get into all of that stuff and stay there for a little bit longer. So it was no dramas. Everyone still got what they wanted out of the practice. Um, Similar thing has happened to me in the opposite direction, that I have been teaching a 90 minute class and at the 75 minute mark, you know, we're, not, we're like just quieting down, getting towards Shavasana. Someone said, uh, James, this is, we, we have to go now. That one's a little bit more cringe. Uh, there's not that much you can do about it. Um, you just gotta be honest and hold your hands up and say, hey, I made a mistake. Um, if the room's, if you know the room's available for a bit longer, get, keep everyone in Shavasana, but yeah, that one you can't, it's much harder to save. It depends on if, uh, if, they've, if your students have extra time and if the room that you're using has extra time, then maybe it can, you know, it can be saved, but otherwise you gotta, you gotta hold your hands up and accept that, the error, that you made an error there. Um, and then I would, uh, you know, encourage everyone to take a shavasana when they get back home or, or have a, have a, try and have a quiet sit down outside the studio if other people are coming in, that kind of thing. So this is the beauty of um, time stamping. Um, I really recommend that you get used to this system so that you are able to employ it. Even if you don't like working like this, it's a great skill to cultivate because if ever you decide you want to do something as complicated as the chakra practice that I did with you, which is three hours and a ton of techniques. It, it's impossible to time that one. Um, uh, it's impossible to time that one precisely without time stamping. Um, or at least I find it, 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 it's impossible. So it's a really useful technique to have, especially when you're getting into workshopping um, and this kind of thing. 
even if you don't use it every time. So now this training is a great opportunity to practice that skill and to dialogue with me um, or the other teachers about it. Um, show me how you are time stamping and let me take a look at it and let me give you some feedback. Let me say, yeah, you, yeah, okay, this is good. How you're doing this? I would change the way you're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, okay, so let's get back to some my notes. Um, as you create this sequence, each asana speaks to the next. So there is an evolution uh, through the sequence. Each asana is a foundation for the ones that come after it. Um, and the important thing about having this sequence is that you don't have to stick rigidly to it. By this I mean that sometimes you have to throw the sequence out. Because sometimes you had planned to do um, a, a certain sequence and when you start teaching the class, it becomes apparent that it is not appropriate or it's not suitable for the students who have turned up today. So maybe you had, um, you had planned to do uh, a headstand sequence and you're going to do seven different forms of headstand in the second half of the class um, and then the three students that turn up that day uh, are all have physical limitations that mean they will not be able to do a headstand. Maybe they all suffer from neck issues. Uh, and you know, that's what you had planned. Okay, you need to toss out that idea and you need to come up with something in the moment. So that is going to happen a lot. Um, if you are doing, let's say, a peak pose class, and maybe the poses are getting more and more advanced as you go, and you get to a certain pose and no one can do it, well, don't keep pushing on. Don't go to a more advanced version of that pose if no one could do that pose. You know, you go, okay, this is, this is as far as we're going to go with that now with this class, and now I'm going to find something else. That's when that closing sequence that I just showed you is going to become very, very useful. Um, so be prepared to change from this sequence. This is the skeleton sequence that you're operating from, but you have to be able to go with the flow. You have to be able to respond to what's happening in the moment. And sometimes it's not appropriate to stick with the sequence. Sometimes, you know, you're doing something, you're teaching this, and you realize no one in the room knows how to do, um, everyone's trying to do chaturanga, they're doing a really unhealthy variations of it, looks kind of injurious, none of them know how to do tricep press, and you decide, okay, what is go best going to serve the, um, the students today is to work through tricep press, and I'm gonna take the next 10, 15 minutes teaching them that, even though that's not what I had planned, and then you're going to have to adapt the sequence afterwards as a result. Um, your sequence will usually change from what you had written down, and that's a good thing. That means that you're responding to what you see. That means that you are truly in service to the people in the room, um, because you are adapting your sequence to what, what it is that they need in the present moment. Um, we've said it before, and we'll say it again, keep it simple. Keep it simple. There is, it's almost like a disease in the modern yoga world of feeling like you have to entertain, like you need to be an entertainer, that you have to come up with all these new funky transitions that no one's done before, that you have to have playlists that no one's heard before, that you need to be an entertainer. This is not, um, this is not a healthy way of approaching your, your classes or your sequencing. There is so much beauty in simplicity. Some of the, some of the most um, beloved teachers out there, their practice is so simple. If you do a practice with my teacher Vishva in Rishikesh, Vishvaji, so simple. He's got 
such a huge following. Clive Sheridan, one of the best um, uh, teachers you'll ever meet. He's been teaching for 50 years. Such a simple practice. Max Strom, amazing teacher. So simple. Keep it really simple. There's not, none of this uh, elaborate, um, show-offy, showiness. So much value in this. Um, teach what you practice and practice what you teach. So when it's coming from a place of authenticity, it is so much more powerful for the students and it's also so much easier for you. So much easier when you are teaching what you practice because you're coming from, you don't have to think about it. You don't have to come from memory. You're speaking from experience. In terms of um, sequencing, if you're doing incorporating pranayama and meditation, what, which sequence, um, which order do things go? This is a, a great question. Do you do asana and then pranayama and then meditation, which is as it's uh, outlined in the eight limbs? Yeah, that's a great way of doing things. But also, you don't have to stick to that. You know, in, um, uh, in India, when, if you're in an ashram, meditation time is 5.30 a.m. It's the first thing you do. You wake up, you do your kriyas, and you get to the meditation hall, and you meditate for the first hour. Why? Because that hour, just before it gets light, is said to be the magic hour, where everything is still quiet, no one's awake yet, there's no noise outside. The sun is just about to come up. This is the magic meditation hour. So many, many people, Vishva, Clive, both of them, if you go on retreat with them, then they will start the day off with um, meditation and maybe meditation, then pranayama, or maybe pranayama, then meditation. Both ways around are possible. And then they'll do asana afterwards. And then maybe they'll do once a little bit of pranayama at the end of the asana practice. So maybe you'll do the bulk of your pranayama before asana, and then just finish off with Nadi Shadana at the end. So there are different ways of sequencing this. What is your intention is the question. For myself, when I'm teaching a teacher training, my experience has shown that people coming on a 28-day training or a 30-day training like this one, um, it's pretty tiring. They're not used to it. This is not... Um, you know, this is, they've never done anything like this before. They've never practiced with this uh, regularity and this intensity. Therefore, I find that if I make everyone wake up at 6 a.m. and come straight to the hall and I put them straight into meditation, a lot of them start falling asleep. It just, it's just not working for me in my experience. But if I do asana first, and they are awake and they're energized and I put meditation after that, I find it's more successful. So I, I organize things that way around. But if I was doing a retreat of five days, I would, probably do, I would probably put the meditation first. So you can see that my sequence changes in response to the needs of the particular group in question. Um, so this is something we can talk more about if you like, about where where we should do pranayama, where we should do meditation. Uh, in truth, you can do uh, pranayama meditation can come before and can come after asana. It can go in both places. And sometimes I do split them up. So some um, pranayams and kriyas, for example, Nadi Shuddhana, sorry, uh, Kapalabhati and Uddhyana Bandha, these make sense to go at the beginning of the practice when we want to lift the energy. We're on the upward slope of raising energy. And practices like Brahmari and Nadi Shodana, I will put at the end of a practice because that's when we want to calm things down. Um, remember that physically um, it's easier to release something after it's had a good workout. Yeah, we, we talked about it. I demonstrated it with Paddy once, post-isometric relaxation. So that was when um, he was in this position and I had my shoulder against his leg and he pushed his heel, he pushed his leg that way against me, but I gave him resistance. And then after that, we found that he had 
it was easier for him to go into the stretch in this direction. Because after you've worked something, it's easier to let that thing go. So you can keep that in mind as you create your sequence. You know, that's why Shavasana goes at the end. It's easier to relax after you've had the workout. Work from Stira to Sukham, right? To work in those, uh, the, make sure that you're cultivating steadiness and stability so that we can move towards comfort and ease. Know your counter poses because that is going to be part of your sequence. If you are um, doing something like headstand or shoulder stand or back bends, know the counter poses. We need to incorporate those into the sequence. We need to give time for them. Um, and you will have posture clinics for all of those things by the end of the course. Um, be aware of the variations, modifications, and props necessary for every pose in your sequence so that you can offer them up. Um, Yeah, so that's, I just want to take a little tangent for a moment and just give you a little bit of information about the way that I sequence. So what it is that I'm doing um, when I sequence in my classes. And I've mentioned that a few times, but the way I see it is that in modern life, we are biased towards flexion. So that means this position, yeah? Being rounded back, closed down in the front. And so we tend to, we tend to have a lot of flexion in our daily lives. And when I look at the vinyasa practices out there, um, vinyasa practices also seem to be biased towards flexion. There's a lot of forward folds in a vinyasa practice. So that sort of like makes me a bit curious. It's like, well, if we've already got excess flexion in our daily lives, why are we putting so much more flexion into the vinyasa practice? Personally, my preference is to start to bring some more extension into the vinyasa practice. I'm already getting loads of this. Lots of backgrounding happening all day as I'm on my phone all day and at my computer all day and so on. So looking for where can I create a little bit more um, extension? So I'm looking... <laughs> so I'm looking for... Um, I'm looking for opportunities to strengthen the back body and to lengthen the front body in when I teach or when I practice. Why? Because I'm usually doing the opposite to that. I've got... We've got weak back bodies, most of us, and we have these closed down tight front bodies from being in this position. So looking to, for any opportunities to strengthen the back, you know, locust pose, halfway lift, these kinds of things, and lengthen the front body. It is for this reason that I'm using a sun salutation with lunges in it. Because the, the sun, sun sanitation without lunges doesn't get much of a front body opening, doesn't get much of a back strengthener. But incorporating the lunges adds those elements in. Um, low lunge, so kneeling lunge, really good for lengthening the front body. High lunge, really good for strengthening the back body. So I actually use both uh, in, my, in my class. Um, and that's why I've been emphasizing this thing about using halfway lift to get that the lower back, middle back, upper back all working and creating strength and not just keeping the hands on the floor and all that's happening is I'm lifting my head. There's no back strengthening happening when I do that. So hands here and then strengthen the back by creating that arch. Um, Yes, 
one of the reasons why I am using um, low boat pose a lot of the time. So I'm incorporating this pose a lot, not just this one. It's because here, this is working the hip flexors much more. So it's get it with it, getting those hip flexors uh, engaged. But what we need more of is the anterior core, and this targets the anterior core much more. So I'm incorporating low boat pose as well as uh, full boat pose. Um, yeah, so that's just a little bit about, um, just to give you some indication of why I'm sequencing the way things, uh, the way that I do in the classes that I'm offering. Um, the last thing I want to say, just to wrap all of this up, is just go back to the first lecture. What, what is yoga all about? It's about waking up. It's about the interconnectivity of all things. It's about seeing reality as it truly is. It's about moving towards that state in which the mental emotional fluctuations have become still. So I think that those things should be always be in the background to whatever um, sequence we're creating. So even if we're creating a sequence for back care, um, the, there is this overarching goal of, yes, I want to um, help people with their back pain so that they can then move on to the next thing, which is waking up, which is seeing reality as it truly is. Because if, if your back pain is holding you back in your practice, then that is a thing that needs to be addressed. But we're addressing it so that we can then continue on with this journey of, of free, liberating ourselves from suffering, liberating ourselves from uh, identification with those things that are leading us towards suffering. So um, that will often just be a um, that will just be an implicit theme rather than an explicit theme, as in that's, that is there in my sequencing, but I don't have to talk about it and announce it to everyone. It's just in the background always to the way that I sequence. Um, so that is a huge, great uh, sequencing lecture. Lots to think about, lots to incorporate. I hope that you find it useful and, and I'd love to chat with you about it because it's really one of my favorite things when it comes to asana. So I hope that you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you again soon in the next one. Thank you.